Hello, and uh, we continue our series of the Gems of the Alshech. We move on uh, to not just a new Parsha, but a new, a new book in the Torah, in fact, the last book of the Torah, uh, the Parsha of Devarim, Deuteronomy in English. And it's intriguing because Rashi says here, and we'll start off with our art scroll as we normally do, the Seder begins by saying, Eleh HaDvorim Asher Diber Moshe El Kol Yisrael. These are the words which Moses spoke to the whole Jewish people. Now, anybody who's a, a master educator will know that, and who is a greater educator, a greater master of education than Moshe Rabbeinu, whose title after all is Moshe the teacher. There's a million things we could call him, the king of the Jewish people, the lawgiver, um, whatever you like. Uh, the defeater of Pharaoh, if you want to be dramatic. However, um, his ultimate title is he's a teacher. And it's one of the great techniques of teachers, really good teachers, is before they move on to the next lesson, to the next stage of the education of the child or the, or the students, he guarantees and he secures that what he's previously taught has sunk in. You've got to solid foundations before you build the next, the next level, the next floor of the building. Here is Moshe Rabbeinu about to leave the Jewish people for good. He's about to pass away. The whole book of Devorim is his valedictory, his, his final address to them. And he sums up all the lessons of the past, including all the places that the Jewish people made mistakes. And that's the next stage. Let's read this again. There's the first verse in, in, in Deuteronomy and Devarim. El ha-devarim asher liber Moshe kol Yisrael. These are the words of Moses that speak to the whole Jewish people. Be'ever yarden over the Jordan River, Bamidbar in the desert, at Rovo in the plain, Malsuf, opposite the Suf, the Yam Suf, the Red Sea, Ben Poran and Ben Toifo, between a place called Poran and Toifo, the Loven, the place called Loven, the Chatseras, the place called Tser, the Dizov, and a place called Dizov, Achri, also, and then it tells you when all this was. That's very strange that to have a geographic location, you, you need to have, I mean, triangulation is usually enough to know where somebody is. We've got so many places, and Rashi says here that the places that it refers to were not actually geographical places, they're chronological places. Places in time, or times when the Jewish people challenged and rebelled against God. That's what's going on here. All these places, the meat bar, etc., all places of um, unhappy memories. But Moshe wants to make sure they've learned the lesson of those unhappy memories so that they don't repeat them. And that's Rashi's explanation. So we now come to the al -Sheikh. And I have to tell you that I think that what the al says here is one of his most astute and brilliant observations of anything he says in the Chumash, and that's to say quite a lot. When the al examines that, he fully accepts what Rashi is saying, that all these places are the places where the Jewish people rebelled, but they're not in the right order. They're completely out of order. They're all jumbled up. It should be chronological. When the Jewish people come out from Egypt, the first rebellion is at the Yam Suf. And yet Yam Suf's right at the end of the list. So why is it that's there? Why not at the beginning? Why not chronologically? So if you're if you remember, the Jewish people come to the, to the Red Sea, they've got an Egyptian army chasing after them, their backs to the water, backs to the to the sea. And they cry out and they rebel. Why did God bring us here? What's going on? Are we going to die? Uh, first rebellion. Then they cross over and the miracle happens. Everybody knows the miracle. They cross over. Three days later, there's no water for them. And then they start rebelling again. Again. So it should start off saying, Bayam Suf. And then it should go on to the next chronological rebellion three days later, Bamidbar. Why is that out of order? Well, the Alshech says something which is astonishing, and it shows the genius of the Alshech and the brilliance of Moshe Rabbeinu. In reminding the Jewish people of what they did in the past, to make sure they've learnt the lesson before he goes on to secure the next lesson, the next stage, he's got to make sure that A, they're going to accept it, and B, they're going to understand what they did wrong. Acceptance is a very important idea. If you criticise someone, for something they did wrong, and they can't deny that they did it wrong, they did something wrong. However, when you point out what they did wrong, they say, yes, admitted it, and then they add just one word, one word, that will undo absolutely everything you're trying to say, and that moment of acceptance from just a few seconds before, if they say, yes, but, as soon as somebody says, but, 
then that's an excuse, that's a justification. Moshe Rabbeinu knows that if he challenges them directly, they are in all probability going, probability going to reject criticism. Human beings do that very easily. Nobody likes to be criticized. So he only hints to them the places where they rebelled. That's what Rashi says. It's only a hint to see if they're willing to accept the criticism. And then he can go on to, as it were, full throttle, go up to, to full gear and explain exactly what they did wrong. But they will never get to that stage of acceptance if they can use the word but. So Moshe Rabbeinu wants to remove the ability of them, of them saying but. So let's go through the list again then. So the first time the Jewish people rebel, out of chronological order, but the order that God, or rather Moshe, writes this in the Torah, inspired by God, it says the following thing. It was, the early divine, these are the words which Moshe speaks, I'll call Israel, by Eber Yar, on the other side of the Jordan River, Bamidbor. So the first one was Bamidbor, but that was after they crossed the river, after, sorry, the river of the sea. Why not start with the rebellion at the other side? And the answer is really very simple. Because if you start chronologically, the Jewish people say, yeah, of course we rebelled. But then they've got a but. But do me a favour. We were 210 years in Egypt. We were completely absorbed in all the, the idolatry and the philosophy of Egyptian society. Uh, regaining a perspective of God was new. We were only, it was only a year of miracles. So of course we failed. Yeah, we admit it. But, in order that Moshe Rabbeinu <clears throat> removes that but, then he takes them to the, the next one and lists that as his first. The next chronological uh, rebellion was when they crossed the sea and then they complained because they got no water, no food, etc. But that's after they've been through the biggest miracle, Kriya Siamsuf. They can't say it's all new. They can't say that, yeah, no, no, this was it. That Yamsuf, uh, what, what uh, the Jewish people see at the, the Yamsuf, at the Red Sea, is bigger than anything else, um, as the verse famously says. What a, a, a mere girl saw, a young girl saw at the, at the Yamsuf was greater than Yechezkel ben Buzi, the prophet Yechezkel. That was the clincher. She can't say, oh, you're all new to it. And they were, no, no, no. You saw the miracles in Egypt, and you went through the Yamsuf. So therefore, he doesn't start with the one where we can say a but. He starts with this one. But they still have a but. For goodness sake, they have no food. Who would not rebel? If you've got no food, if you've got no water, you're going to die of thirst. What are we supposed to do? We're only human beings. It's because we had nothing. We were so desperate. So then Moshe Rabbeinu constructs the next criticism, which goes on to Barova in the plain. That refers to the rebellion at Shittim. That's when the, the whole Baal Pa'or, we talked about that just, just recently, when the Jewish people get sucked into the whole idolatry thing with the Midianite woman. What's your excuse there? Oh, sorry, your, your excuse before, your but before was because you didn't have stuff, you were desperate, you were, you had nothing to eat. Well, there you had everything in the world. You just conquered two countries. You're standing at the, the, the border of Israel. You had so much money and so much cattle and absolute, And then... You rebelled. Um, yeah. But, but, but that's because he gave us too much. Everybody knows that people say <laughs> it's the lottery ticket winners. Yeah, all that money spoils them and they're divorced in a second and they're miserable and they commit suicide. There are books written about this. We know that. So you gave us too much. It's not our fault. That's when Moshe Rabbeinu goes back to the Yamsuf. When again, they were absolutely des desperate and had nothing. And they rebelled then again. But every single place that he mentions is cleverly constructed. It's like a game of chess to check any move that they can make to say the word but. And then that robs them of accepting their mistakes. That stops them learning from their mistakes. As a consequence, Moshe Rabbeinu can't go on to the next stage to build from the lessons of the past that they've not absorbed and accepted the lessons of the past. So he brilliantly constructs all the rebellions, the places of rebellions, out of chronological order, in, in order to make sure that they are fully able to remove the word but from hearing what they did wrong, and therefore move on to the next stage. And then Moshe gives up a gear or two and finds out exactly the mistakes that they made. But it's the way of a master teacher to uh, sum up what went on before before you move on. But they've got to accept. They've got to know. They've got to. It's got to make that knowledge part of them. He constructs the criticism in such a way 
that they're willing and able to make that knowledge part of them, and then they can build.